Hi everybody, my name is Rick, and I've been part of the development of the critical security controls for a number of years, including the latest version 8. And so I'm doing a series on each of the new controls from version 7 to version 8, and this is the seventh in my series. You can find links to 1 through 6 in the description below, as well as a link to the CIS security org page where you can download your own version of the controls to follow along at home next time. So today I'm going to talk about control number seven, contra continuous vulnerability management. <laughs> Um, so vulnerability management is the first of a string of controls that actually moved down the list. The first six I had a number that moved up, including data protection, which was the biggest mover from 13 to 3. Well, the number three slot last time was vulnerability management, which has moved down to number seven on, on the list. It's actually the biggest mover in the next few that I'm going to do. We'll see other ones kind of shifting down. But the reason it moved down is because we started to really look at the hierarchy more objectively and from a risk-based approach, approach. And so we wanted to like be willing to change the list to reflect a modern threat landscape. So vulnerability management is not just about running scans. <laughs> you know, a lot of people think it's like, oh, I run vulnerability scans. What's vulnerability management about? No, um, it's actually about monitoring for asset updates and patches, you know, tracking the threat landscape, linking those threats to business impacts. Like I said before, it's tied to configuration management as it validates secure configuration and feeds back updates to better secure the configuration as new threats are identified. So let's look at the safeguards. <clears throat> uh, bring up, you know, version eight over here, version seven over here. Look, there's only one of each, makes it real easy. Uh, so going through again, remember that we rename safeguards, subcontrols to safeguards, and that we realign the, 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 uh, the safeguards to be along the implementation group. So it's nice and clean on this side where you see you know, 3.4 and 3.5 over here on version seven are for implementation group one. We added 7.1, establish and maintain a vulnerability management process. We did have this before, and like I said, it wasn't just about it, this was not just about running scans. You know, we, we kind of rolled up 75% of control number three here in version seven. You know, we, you know, 3.1, run automated vulnerability management tools, 3.2, perform authenticated vulnerability scans, 3.3, protect dedicated accounts for you know, running these scans, 3.6, compare back-to-back -back scans, 3.7, use risk-based rating to safeguard. All of these would be part of establishing and maintaining a process. We didn't want to get too prescriptive. You know, these are things that certainly, you know, there's plenty of other resources to develop a vulnerability management plan. We just want to say, have one. Uh, this also enforces our approach from version 8 to be more about the what and not about, like, the how. We added 7.2, establish and maintain a remediation process. This is kind of important. <laughs> Otherwise, any scanning doesn't have a process to require remediation <laughs> to stay operational or before something goes uh, deployed, you know, or a route to a governance process where a steering committee can prioritize rescheduling of the remediation or even have a step the business owner can push back on the timing of that remediation so they don't impact operations or that business owner can execute an exception process where the business owner can accept and hopefully is accountable um, for the risk. And then after it's implemented, that the, the, the remediation process will make sure there's a retesting period to make sure that A, it worked, and B, it didn't break anything else in the process. So having a remediation process, very, very important. Um, 7.3. Perform automated operating system patch management. Kind of starts from the 3.4, uh, deploy automated OS patching tools, but then kind of puts a process around it. Uh, 7.4, perform automated app patch management. Starts similarly with 3.5, uh, deploy automated software patch management. Again, we add a process around it. Three dots, I mean, 7.5 and 7.6, we defined that there would be vulnerability scans of internal and external facing assets. These are split because many industry regulations and audits require one, the other, or both. And so we want to make sure that, you know, both are accounted for kind of separately and also to have one ask per safeguard. You know, I wanted to to use a little bit of time to talk about the difference between the different types of scanning. Um, I'll get into more detail in pin test and, and control number 18, but back in the day, we really kind of view it as three. I mean, I ran pin test teams from the late 90s to the late 2000s, and we always considered three levels of kind of thoroughness in doing a scan. There's the vulnerability scan, there's a vulnerability test, and there's a penetration test. So scans are completely automated, not touched by human hands. You run a tool, it sends back a report, expect lots of false positives, you know, really not a lot of value, value, but it's inexpensive and it sometimes passes for compliance that you did something, which is sometimes all organizations 
patients want. When we talk about vulnerability testing, that starts with a scan, but then humans get involved and they weed out the false positive, maybe recheck some of the areas that might be interesting or discover other issues that, that, um, that they can dig into. You know, the goal there is to identify vulnerability if a vulnerability is exploitable and and then but not exploited <laughs> um, and it might be by providing evidence of a particular configuration oh you have this known configuration which is known to be exploitable and here's some code for it or a version of a vulnerable service you have this old version of this application or you know FTP version or SSH version that's known to be have an exploit to it or things like that it adds more value um, because the results are normalized and and they're actionable it's like if you do this you will actually do something to reduce the risk pen test starts with a vulnerability scan, but then is any then it exploits any of the found vulnerabilities to see how far you can get. Often, you know, you will like leave a file, like a dropper, as we would say on the system, prove that we had access, like, oh, that's not really vulnerable. I updated that. It's like, well, look on this directory and you'll see a file that said I was here. Um, even a couple of times people have changed the background settings of executives or their customer to be able to say, hey, I've changed your background, your, your uh, wallpaper on your desktop just to show you I had control over it. And sometimes even because of certain trust relationships, we'll find that once we're in that we can get, we could probably, you know, show that there is a path to a other partner organization or another customer. And so, you know, this penetration test is getting as far as you can and kind of proving the point and seeing if we can get to. And again, ver and control 18, I'll dig a lot more into that. But I just wanted to kind of like highlight that we're talking about vulnerability management and their vulnerability scans, which may not necessarily be testing. And then we added 7.7 to enforce that you need to have to need to remediate detected vulnerabilities. I mean, you would be surprised <laughs> that this isn't fundamental. I had a customer in the last 20 years of me doing this, who had requirements to do vulnerability testing, but not a requirement to fix it. Again, remember that remediation that we added in 7.2? Uh, we only had to require to create a remediation plan. So we'd come back the next year, perform another test, find the same issues, and that they would just update the remediation plan with a new date and sign off crazy, you know, so we have a plan. Um, this is why you need to have a remediation plan so that there might be gates to not allow a system or application to be put in production or stay in production until the critical or high vulnerabilities are fixed. So you see, we put a lot of focus on the update of updating this control to do remediation, not just like find vulnerabilities. Okay, now that I've known the changes, let me put these down and let me put up the details over here on the left side, my left, your right. 7.1, start with establishing a process process for vulnerability management. I talked about the, things why, the reasons why we need to do that. We go more into description of this in the narrative, but one of the things I do want to add is make sure you include all platforms, whether it's on-site, in the cloud, mobile, third-party, software as a service, etc. And, and we do say review the process annually. In 7.2, develop a risk-based remediation strategy. This is to prioritize what to fix um, based on the biggest impact to risk reduction or the largest risk to the organization. 7.3, automated operating system patching at least monthly. Pretty straightforward. We indicated using agents in, seven, in version seven, and, you know, or privileged service accounts to be able to do this. Um, the reason for authenticated scanning, just to go into that, is it gives a deeper view into configuration settings, installed applications, and application versions. If if it was unauthenticated, we would just see what the ports, what ports were open, and what like the the prompts were when it says, oh, this is FTP version XXX, you know, that kind of thing. But we don't really know what other things might be installed that aren't necessarily running at the time or don't have any ports open. So on RK scanning, you just kind of see, you know, what the banners give you. And we have subcontrol and, and 3.3 from version 7 to protect these service accounts, but that's specifically covered now in control 4 when we talk about account management and how to protect accounts. And 7.6, automated external vulnerability scans. We recommend these monthly or more frequently. Uh, and going by my discussion on difference between scans, vulnerability testing, and pen testing, this is just a scan. Uh, it'd be great if you did vulnerability testing, like, you know, semi-annually or annually, and pen testing annually. We'll talk about that in the pen test control. But monthly scans, this is automated. We're talking vulnerability scans. Uh, give a regular look to see that you don't have things that you didn't expect is really what it's for. And we talk about in the narrative to do to scan ranges and of a range of addresses instead of like what you expect to find. I mean, there's been many organizations over the years that I found that 
they would just do vulnerability scans of what's in their asset management database. It's like, here's what I have, I'm gonna scan it. Well, what about things you don't know about? And so that's why taking full IP ranges that you own, particularly externally, and kind of seeing what's there, because that discovery scan phase, you know, in map scan, as we would say, you know, to be able to see what's actually listening and what's active and what has some port available to it, you know, is kind of helps define and, and also enriches asset management in control number one. And then finally in 7.7, remediate monthly or more frequently. This ties to the remediation process, but this safeguards calls out to actually do it, <laughs> you know. Um, and this is where you may have a policy that says, you know, critical vulnerabilities on production facing systems at, you know, the sensitive data level need to be fixed in 24 hours, 38 hours, 36 hours, whatever. So there are a lot of organizations in their remediation plan will have specific SLAs they have for themselves that, you know, medium vulnerabilities may be fixed in two weeks or a month or whatever, you know, but at least have something that you can measure against to be able to have some metrics for it. So then remediating the vulnerabilities is kind of like the whole point in doing this, right? So let's look at the upfront material or the narratives we call it. I'll take down the details here and put back up page one. We put a lot of content in the narrative of, of this particularly control um, because there was a lot, uh, because a lot of the safeguards were about process and we wanted to make sure we covered all the details here. We explained in the overview to talk about developing a voluntary management process. And while we don't have a specific safeguard about the threat intelli doing threat intelligence and including that, we talk about monitoring public and private industry sources for this information in the overview and the why this control is critical. We further talk about staying timely and in threat information around software vulnerabilities and patches. You know, who are the security adversaries? What are their common exploit techniques to verify that you aren't exposed? We talk about how attackers have access to the same public threat and vulnerability information that you do, but can move a lot more quickly to exploit than many organizations can do to remediate. We discuss the concept of zero day exploits where attacks use an exploit to a vulnerability that isn't known publicly yet. And, and to clarify, the, the clock doesn't start ticking when an exploit uh, for exploit creation when a vulnerability is published publicly. It's often already been known for days, weeks, months, or even years before the public is aware. So, so don't think that you're staying ahead of patching quickly when there is a notice of a new vulnerability Always just expect that there's a vulnerability you don't know exists and look for suspicious behavior and traffic. Uh, this will be covered more in Control 13, Network Monitoring Defense, but you know, there's a lot of like use of the word, oh, it's a zero day vulnerability. It's like, well, we've kind of known about it for a long time. We close this section out by talking about the importance of vulnerability management and the only way to scale remediation is to prioritize based on business impact. So we'll switch to page two and procedures and tools. We talk about the numerous different vulnerability scanning tools that exist and that you should use one that is SCAP compliant, secure content automation protocol uh, that maps to industry, industry recognized classification schemes such as CVE, CCE, CVSS, etc. We talk about scanning frequency and the use of authenticated scans. We talk about tools that evaluate configurations that could identify vulnerabilities due to user permissions or configuration weaknesses not not visible from the scan, from the authenticated scans. And we highlight the need to link scan output to problem ticketing systems to manage, track, and report on remediation effort. These will produce reports with metrics for required items like the time to repair certain classifications vulnerabilities that I talked about a little before, you know, which not just may not be an internal thing, but also might be required by regulation or some SLA with the customer. Uh, we talk about the use of IT steering committee to link business owners to the systems to help with prioritize remediation. The business owners own the business risk to it and they may choose to defer a remediation for some business need, but they need to be accountable for that. We provide guidance on how to prioritize based on NIST CVSS, uh, the presence of known exploits, evidence of exploit used in a while, uh, presence of a patch, etc. These things kind of go into whether or not we want to prioritize things. And we talk about comparing results of current scan with previous scan, which actually was you know version seven control 3.6. Uh, to track trends and SLAs for remediation. And we close by mentioning that the use of a quality assurance process to test that once a patch has been fixed, a, a patch or fix is implemented, that has actually fixed a problem and didn't break something else in the meantime. The QA aspect of this is, is quite important and also kind of help tracking you know, progress and maturity.
So hopefully this was helpful to go over the changes from version 7 to version 8. There seemed to be a lot, even though it was a like for a like, as I said before. Um, if you haven't already, please go download the controls yourself from cissecurity.org. And if you have any questions or comments, sign up for the controls workbench where you can contribute to the next version's controls. There's a lot of people, just like this weekend, someone had asked a question about one of the controls, and there was a lot of response from people inside CIS, from people who are using it. You know, it's a really good community to help answer questions if you have anything. Of course, you can leave me a comment below and make sure to click like and subscribe and I'll talk to you later. Hi everybody, as you know by now, we have no pets to share, but we have a lot of found object art pieces. This guy was made from an old clock with some key hands and standing on some drawer pool feet and a cigarette box. He seems very whimsical. Have a great day.